So I'll quickly get on um, and first of all uh, bring you through the, the profile of Irish agriculture, the level of emissions that we have, the policy context that we're set in and uh, then if I've time some solutions maybe that, uh, that we can look at going forward. So in terms of Irish agriculture and land use, agricultural land takes up about 4.5 million hectares of the country, most of which is grassland. About 91% of our agricultural area is permanent pasture. Of the rest of it, crops make up about uh, between 8 and 9%. Forest, which is an agricultural land, takes up about 3 quarters of a million uh, hectares. And then if you look at the breakdown of our livestock base, we have about 7 million cattle, 5 million sheep, 1.6 million pigs, and 10 million uh, chickens, which are split between broilers that you eat and layers which provide eggs. In terms of the economic uh, benefits of the country, um, agri-food um, supplies about 7.6% of gross value added. This is from 2016 numbers. 8.6% of employment, including 140,000 family farms. Okay, and all that employment is rural, so it's the largest rural employer in the country, and 10.3% of exports. So it's quite a large, uh, quite a large uh, uh, sector uh, for the country. If you look at the, how how the uh, agriculture is split, there is this uh, west, west, north, south, east uh, divide. Okay, and what you see is that about 80% of dairy farmers and most of the tillage farmers are in the south and eastern region. The average farm size here is just under 40 hectares, and the st average standard output about 50,000 um, 50, euros okay, per farm. If you look at the western region, the average size is 27 hectares, the average output 23,000 uh, euros per farm, and it's about 68%, nearly 70% of sheep uh, production uh, is in this region. Okay, and again, if we look at the breakdown uh, of our, the Irish landscape, you see that 76%, we have a lot of grassland, um, of managed grassland. We have what's called rough grazing, which is unmanaged grassland, which is primarily for sheep production. We've got commonage, again, for sheep and beef production. And then um, crops, fruits, and cereals take up about somewhere between 7 and 9% of the country. Okay. So why have we got this predominance of grassland? Well, it's the same in Northern Ireland and also uh, in Wales and, and Scotland. There would tend to be grassland-dominated environments. And we're grass-based mainly because we have a long growing season and so we can have a long grazing season. It means that it makes livestock production very cheap because they're just feeding off grass that's growing. Okay, so if we look at uh, the strategy in terms of growth of the industry, so um, when uh, milk quotas were removed um, back in 2014, or even before that, with the Department of Agriculture had very ambitious uh, strategies to grow uh, the agri-food sector, both in terms of primary production of milk and meat, uh, and also in terms of uh, value added in terms of agri-food exports. So what we see is that uh, the Foodwise strategy wanted to increase the value of agri-food exports by 85% to 19 billion by 2025, increase value to the sector by 70% to the, to the agriculture sector, up to 13 billion, to increase the value of primary production by 65% and to deliver 23,000 jobs to the agri-food sector. So, so these were basically value-based targets which were uh, uh, seen as growing uh, both our exports growing our competitiveness uh, and increasing the number of jobs in the agri-food sector. And what we've seen is that um, FoodWise and its previous, uh, the previous programme called Food Harvest 2020 uh, has already seen uh, very large uh, uh, increases in production capacity. So since 2009, agri-food exports have increased 56%, dairy production by over 25% since 2009, and even in the bottom graph, the, the EU forecasts um, that over the next uh, 10 years or so, that uh, uh, Ireland, uh, in terms of milk production particularly, uh, will increase production uh, quite significantly compared to other EU countries. So that's the production side of things. But what about the environmental side of things? So greenhouse gases 
uh, agriculture comprises a third of national greenhouse gas emissions, and this is very, very unusual for uh, an OECD country. Of the OECD countries, only New Zealand has a larger proportion of its total greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. And the reasons for that are twofold. It's first of all because we have very little heavy industry. So there's no industry to dilute the agricultural emissions. And the second is that we have a very large livestock sector. A lot of Central European countries would be primar primarily cereal crop based, so til tillage and arable, uh, fruit, cereals, vegetables, etc. Uh, we, on the other hand, are primarily grass-based and have a lot of animals. And we not, not only have, in terms of greenhouse gases, but we also have what I call the poor relation, which is ammonia. Ammonia indirectly causes greenhouse gases, but it's an air quality issue, the same as noxes or particulate matter, or the stuff that comes out of, say, diesel cars. Okay. So ammonia is an acidifying gas, and its main impact is in uh, causing changes to um, uh, peatlands and areas where there are very little nutrient inputs. So ammonia can be uh, a pollutant of waterways as well. Uh, the thing about ammonia is it all comes from agriculture. Okay, 98% of national ammonia emissions from agriculture. Uh, in terms of our greenhouse gases, up to now you've been dealing with carbon dioxide mainly. We're very different within agriculture. Okay. Virtually no CO2 associated with agriculture per se. Okay? Most of um, Irish greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture are from what's called enteric fermentation. To put it in simple terms, cattle burping. Okay? So just to tell you, the methane that comes out of uh, a cow, it co all comes out the front end, only 10% of it comes out the back end. So that's, uh, that's, 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 that's a bit of a misnomer. Okay? So, so, about two-thirds of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions are methane-based, 80% of that from, ca <coughs> from cattle belching. The other 20% of methane comes from uh, manure management. And then the other third of uh, greenhouse gases is nitrous oxide, or you'd know it better as laughing gas. Uh, and that comes mainly from fertilizer application to soils or for animals defecating and urinating onto soils. So in fact, when somebody asked me what my research is involved in, it's animals belching, urinating, and defecating for the most part. <laughs> so in terms of our ammonia emissions then again, most of it comes from cattle housing, so slurry pits and manure pits, um, some of it from land spreading uh, of that slurry and manure, uh, and some of it from storage. So, as you can see, most of our emissions are primarily animal-based. In fact, only 1.2 or 1.5 percent comprises CO2, and that's mainly from power or from fuel uh, for tractors and things like that. Okay. However, there is another category called land use, land use change, and that releases very, very substantial amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. In fact, on a global scale, agriculture is 14% of emissions, but land use change is 18% of emissions. That's mainly deforestation for agricultural land. Okay. So the challenges. I've talked you through what our, um, our targets are going to be in terms of our production targets. What are the consequences of that for Irish agricultural emissions? <coughs> so this is our best guess. Uh, or Well, it's a projection. It's not really a guess at all. Uh, of where our emissions are going to be by 2030. Sorry, it's cut out here on um, the slide. So by 2030, um, we see that uh, our emissions uh, are going to rise um, reasonably substantially, probably by about uh, one to two megatons. On the other hand, our current greenhouse gas targets are a 20% reduction by 2020 and a 30% reduction by 2030. In fact, in your papers that you have, you will see there's a graph there of it. Um, so we have a 30%, it's figure two. We have a 30% reduction. There are flexibilities that we have in that we can offset some of these emissions with carbon sequestration, <coughs> and we can buy some carbon credits as well. In terms of ammonia, we have to reduce by 1% to 2030, and after 2030, we have to have a 5% reduction in emissions. And as you can see, again, looking here, <coughs> we. Uh, we're going to increase our emissions in the short term without mitigation. So we need to provide mitigation in order to reach these targets. 
Okay. If we talk about widespread sustainability, and sustainability is a word that gets bandied around an awful lot. Um, it means different things to different people. Okay, it could be environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, social sustainability. And there, there needs to be a pragmatic balance between economic, social, and environmental concerns for the sector. Okay, not only that, we also have to, uh, to balance greenhouse gas targets with other environmental targets, which I'll come into. So if we look at economic and social sustainability, what we see, first of all, is that the most sustainable part of the, or the most viable part of the economy is in the dairy and tillage sector, whereas only about a quarter of cattle and sheep farms are considered sustainable uh, or viable in any economic terms, and that's defined as the ability to earn minimum wage plus 5% return per annum. And if we look at the, the, the opposite of this, which is vulnerability, what we can see is that the greatest amount of vulnerability, again, is in the cattle and sheep sector, the lowest in the dairy and tillage sector. And again, this is defined as having a high age profile, high risk of isolation, high amount of hours being worked on the farm, and household vulnerability, which again is this lack of economic viability. And if we look then at performers within each of those sectors, and I just, I just moved the dairy sector, I just zoned in on the dairy sector here, what we've done in our national farm survey is to divide farmers between the top performers, middle performers, and bottom third of performers. And what we see is that the carbon footprint of those farms, the higher performers have the lowest carbon footprint. So the most efficient farms and the guys who are earning the most, pro who are earning the greatest margins, are in fact the most green, are, are in terms of carbon footprint, the most efficient. And also in terms of of nitrogen intensity, so nitrogen fertilizer intensity, they also term to be, tend to be the most efficient as well. And so I've given you some bad news in terms of our emissions are going up and our absolute emissions are going up and have to be tackled. In terms of our footprint, that's coming down. So this is our dairy carbon footprint. We have the second lowest dairy carbon footprint in the, uh, in the European Union. Um, the aim is to get it to the lowest. And our carbon footprint for dairy is uh, decreasing by 2% per annum. So we expect a 20% reduction over the next uh, 10 years or so. As well as greenhouse gases, though, as we have to see it within the prism and within the context of wider environmental sustainability. So something that's good for greenhouse gases isn't necessarily good for ammonia or for biodiversity or for water quality. So biodiversity, uh, again, we're doing a lot of work on looking at different landscapes. And in terms of water quality, the, the biggest way to improve on um, greenhouse gases, on ammonia, and on water quality is to reduce nutrient inputs into the system, reduce the amount of fertilizer you're applying. Okay? And we have a large number of programs, particularly our agricultural catchments programs, that are validating the impacts of measures on both uh, phosphorus and nutrient loading <coughs> excuse me, uh, to water bodies. So what are our solutions in terms of greenhouse gases? Well, in terms of, I'll deal with nitrous oxide first. In terms of nitrous oxide, it's really shifting the type of fertilizer and the amount of fertilizer we use. First of all, using less fertilizer. So putting in things like clover, that fix atmospheric nitrogen, and reducing the amount of uh, fertilizer that's being put out on farm, but also the use of novel fertilizers. We've been uh, doing uh, quite a lot of studies on um, what's called protected urea products. The main form of fertilizer we use in the country is calcium ammonium nitrate, which has a high amount of nitrous oxide emissions associated with it. Um, with urea, this protected urea product, we're seeing about a 70% reduction in methane, or sorry, in nitrous oxide, okay? Um, also improved uh, soil management, improved liming. Um, manure additives into our slurry pits. We find that where there's additives that we're looking at that can reduce methane and reduce ammonia by 90%. Okay, So again, right spread rollout of these. And in terms of methane uh, from enteric fermentation, animal genetics to either to produce more milk per cow or more beef per uh, head of cattle so that you need less animals to produce the same amount of produce um, or to select for low methane emitting animals. And also we're looking at feeding different diets. But there's a need, we've got loads of research going on, tons of research, and we've been doing it over the last 10 years, but there is the need for effective knowledge transfer. 
okay, or these reductions won't be enough. We're also looking at anaerobic digestion as well. Okay, so feeding grass, instead of feeding it to an animal, feed it into an anaerobic digestion, a digester and produce biomethane. The last bit is on carbon sequestration and land use. Okay, so carbon sequestration offsets emissions uh, from, from uh, offsets greenhouse gas emissions by simply directly removing CO2 from the atmosphere, plants suck up CO2, turn it into wood, uh, and then also transfer it down into the soil. So we have large amounts of, uh, of CO2 held in our woody biomass, okay, about two and a half million tonnes, um, and soil carbon uh, is a more permanent stock, and that can remain in situ for hundreds of years. Okay? The one caveat is, though, if you plough up, that we have, like I said, 91% of permanent grassland with large, large stocks of carbon. We've had an awful lot of carbon in Irish soils, particularly in our peat soils. You plough that up for tillage, and you release an awful lot of CO2, somewhere between 5 and 35 tonnes of CO2 per annum over a 35-year period. Okay? The other thing is that the amount of carbon held in soils depends on your soil type. So a very heavy clay soil like a pod soil holds a, has a very large sink. Think of it like a sink. It's a very large sink and can hold a lot of carbon. A uh, very sandy soil is only a small sink, can only uh, uh, hold a smaller amount of carbon. Okay? And we can use these sinks to offset nearly 6% of our total national emissions. Okay? But our forestry planting rates are running low. There are about 5,000 hectares per year, which is not enough. Um, and we also need to look at other measures. And this is why we need to look at optimal land use. So we need to enhance our grassland and our cropland carbon sinks. So identify those management practices which will lock as much carbon away as possible. We need to maintain and expand our forests. We need to plug carbon hotspots. And by this, I mean uh, farming that's done on peat soils. So some of that needs to be re-wetted. And also in the cutaway bogs that have been used for uh, energy generation for years, again, these need to be re-wetted and restored. And all at the same time, we need to enhance biodiversity, we need to enhance water quality, and manage our soils that also do that. So overall, then, you can end up with this sort of mosaic um, where you identify uh, doing different things on, based on what soil type you're on. You either more intensively do agriculture, you maintain stores, you re-wet soils to enhance more carbon uptake, um, or you plant forestry. So the current schemes and measures we have uh, under government policy, the GLOSS scheme is the main one. That uh, sets in place to preserve uh, hay meadows and low input pastures. Um, it encourages practices such as uh, minimum tillage in instead of inverse inversion ploughing to stop uh, soil carbon loss and to apply agricultural uh, methods that are compatible with uh, the protection of environment, water quality and the landscape. We also have the TAMS2 uh, Agricultural Modern Modernization Scheme which incentivizes um, upgrading of housing facilities and low emission slurry spreading equipment which mainly impacts on ammonia and nitrous oxide but also the more widespread use of water meters, solar panels etc. And Within the, the, the actual uh, uh, EU minimum standards, we have good agricultural and environmental conditions that uh, aim to maintain soil carbon and ground cover, establish buffer strips on uh, water courses and protect groundwater. So very lastly, our, our greenhouse gas research that's currently going on, we're one of the few countries, in fact, that have very accurate reporting of agricultural emissions and between both our Department of Agriculture and our Environmental Protection Agency, there's been a large amount of, they've funded a large amount of research, um, and Chagask as well, in agricultural greenhouse gases. And, and both Chagask and the Irish universities are recognised as world leaders in greenhouse gas research. Um, and we're also deeply embedded in both EU, uh, and EU initiatives and also in um, UN initiatives such as the IPCC. But ultimately, in order to get change in the sector, we're going to have two things to do two things. Better knowledge transfer, and you'll probably hear about this later. We have a, a thing called the Carbon Navigator, which is a partnership between Chagas and Board BIA, to show farmers where their emissions are coming from, to identify where they can reduce their emissions, and to see can they make an extra profit out of this. Okay? So we need to incentivize the farmer to get involved, 
but also there's the demand side measures, right? So globally, OECD countries eat too much meat, eat too much food, full stop. So you go to America and even in Europe, there's a food, there's a food volume issue and there's also a food type issue. So we all need to be eating far more balanced diets. The food waste in the first world is endemic and needs to be cut. And that, that could easily, uh, the study that we're doing at the moment in the IPCC, we're pro projecting that uh, reduction in food waste and everybody eating balanced, diet, balanced diets could wipe maybe 20 to 30% of agricultural and land use greenhouse gas emissions globally. Okay, so there's, there's uh, an onus on the farmer and on the producer, but there's all, and also an onus on the wider public uh, to, to get involved, reduce emissions. Okay, thank you very much.